I want to encourage you all to uh, take out a Bible or your Bible app and open to Jonah. Uh, that's Jonah 1. You're going to find that if you're using the uh, Bibles here or the Bibles at the back in Parker. It's on page 920. Okay, and uh, if you're online, I want to welcome you as well. And if you don't have a Bible, send a message to our online host so we can get you one. I guarantee you it won't get there by the time the sermon's over, but it will get there soon. Um, so we're taking a look at Jonah 1. And uh, as we get started, I want to take a little survey. So you guys are going to get to raise your hand if you're here in the room or you're in Parker. And if you're online, you can just push the like button. Okay, and I want you to be honest with this survey, um, regardless of who's sitting next to you, okay? So uh, the first question is, how many of you have unused Christmas gifts? Raise your hands. Okay, there's a few of you. All right, um, any of those gifts still not even opened out of the package yet? Look at that, okay, I'm surprised. All right, um, how many of you, it's a shirt that you're like, or article of clothing, you're like, I don't think it's the right size, so I'm not gonna use it. Okay, we got a few of those. Um, anybody get something that just seemed way too time consuming, like a 5,000 piece jigsaw puzzle? You just said, like, I don't have time to get into that. Okay, if you're like me, um, you have an unused gift card. Let me see the hands. Okay, good, all right, go ahead and put your hands down. Now, isn't it odd, we're almost to St. Patrick's Day, but we have Christmas gifts that we haven't used. And the people that gave us those gifts, they wanted us to use them. They wanted us to be enjoying them, but they're still in a drawer or in a box or in a closet. I hope none of them are still under the Christmas tree. But, <laughs> but you know, we do this sometimes with the gifts that God has given us. You know, we've spent the last eight weeks talking about the good life, right? About how God wants to bless us. But maybe for some of us here, that blessing is left unopened. We've listened to it and we're like, yeah, you know, I don't know if I want all of that, you know, that goes into that blessing. And so we've kind of just put it on the, the back burner. If you're in that boat today, uh, you're in good company because I think that the man we're going to read about today, Jonah, uh, was very much in that vein. He had gifts from God that he didn't open. In fact, he ran away from God's grace. So let's take a look at uh, Jonah, and we will uh, start in chapter one, and I'm just gonna read the first uh, six verses. We'll go through the whole chapter, but we'll take it kind of chunks at a time. So, in Jonah 1, starting in verse 1. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid and each cried out to his God and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give thought to us that we may not perish. So God's word comes to a man named Jonah. We don't know much about Jonah. Uh, he lived probably about 760 years before Jesus. He was a prophet during the reign of Jeroboam II in the nation of Israel. But God chose this man and he gave him a really specific command. He gave him some very specific instructions. And the instructions were to go to Nineveh and warn them that God has seen their evil. And this brings us to our first point that God writes stories of grace. 
God writes stories of grace. Now you might hear that warning and you might be thinking, that doesn't sound like grace to me. That sounds like punishment, right? This is about God punishing Nineveh. But in reality, I think this is about God desiring to be gracious to Nineveh and to the people there. You guys know that feeling when you're driving a little bit too fast and the red and blue lights start flashing behind you? What is that thing that's going through your mind? You're just, you're saying it over and over again to yourself. I hope I just get a warning, right? That's all you're thinking as you get pulled over. That never works for me. It always works for my wife. <laughs> but a police officer is totally justified in giving me a ticket when I've been speeding. Completely justified. But a warning, well, that's an act of grace. That's something that I don't deserve. That's a kindness. And that's what God is doing here for Nineveh. He's warning them. He wants them to know, hey, I see the bad stuff you're doing, and I want to write a story of grace for you. Why might Nineveh need grace? Well, Nineveh was a pretty big city. Uh, it was 500 miles east of Israel. Uh, it was the capital of um, the Assyrian Empire. It was, a, it was a big city, too about 120,000, which was good size back then. And in the book of Jonah, it tells us that it would have taken about three days to walk across the city. So it's a good sized city. And um, the Assyrians that lived there were known for their ruthlessness when it came to war. The Assyrian army was one of the most brutal armies that's ever existed. If they conquered you, they would take people and put them, impale them on poles while they were alive. They would um, cut off tongues. Uh, they would gouge out eyes. They were ruthless, they were feared, and it's probably part of the reason why Jonah didn't want to go there. Nineveh also was the place where the goddess Ishtar was worshipped. And this goddess was the goddess of fertility and the goddess of war. So the war part makes sense. Fertility part, you know, when it goes to worshiping a goddess of fertility, all of the things that you would think go with that are a lot of, a lot of evil, a lot of debauchery, a lot of depravity. And this is the people that God says, go and warn them. Their evil has been discovered. I see their evil. God had compassion, he, but Jonah had none of that compassion. He had none of that desire for God to forgive or to be kind. And we know this because the book of Jonah tells us exactly what Jonah was thinking when God gave him this command. If you look over just to chapter four, okay, and go to verse two, this is a really cool spot where you can see what was in Jonah's mind. So Jonah said, he prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. You see, Jonah knew what God was going to do. God was going to write a story of grace for Nineveh, but Jonah wanted none of it. It was because that God was gracious. It was because God was loving. It was because God was merciful. It was because God would be kind that Jonah ran away from the presence of the Lord. He ran away from that grace. He didn't want anything to do with it. God wants to write a story of grace in our lives as well. A story of grace for you, a story of grace for me. He wants us to know the blessing of trusting him and following him. He wants us to experience the gift of serving him and ministering alongside of him. He wants us to know the blessing of forgiveness 
God wants us to experience the grace of turning from attempts to live life in our own wisdom and in our own strength, and he wants us to find the joy of living in his wisdom and his strength. But to have God write this story of grace in our lives, we need to realize that there are two realities to following God's plan. And the first reality is that there is sometimes discomfort in following God. There's discomfort in following God. You know, Jonah would have experienced discomfort to obey. He would have had to release some of that hatred that he had. He would have had to release that prejudice that he had to go to seek the well-being of the people in Nineveh. He would have had to let go of his pride that thought, because I'm an Israelite, I'm better than everyone else. He would have had to let go of those things. In a practical sense, traveling 500 miles across land without cars, that would have been a bit of a journey. It would have been a hard journey. And then once he got there, he would have had this cross-cultural experience, right? He would have had to experience idol worship and, and see it, you know, and he would have probably been a little afraid of the army as well. You know, um, some of you might not know this, but my family and I spent about five years on the mission field in Mongolia. And uh, during that time, we had lots of uncomfortable experiences, right? When you are serving God, you just kind of know, okay, this is gonna be uncomfortable. You know, in Mongolia, it's the weather and it's the food, and also it is the idolatry. You know, that is a little bit uncomfortable to be around and to help people see that it's a false system. Jonah would have had to experience those things. Maybe you can identify with Jonah. Maybe you see that running from the discomfort of following God is what you think is your best option. Jesus warned us that there would be discomfort in following him. In Matthew 16, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If you want to save your life, you will lose it, and everyone who loses his life will find it, right? Jesus points to the fact that following him takes some self-sacrifice. After the Good Life series and hearing about how you have to be poor in spirit and you need to mourn and you need to be merciful and you need to hunger and thirst for righteousness and that you might be persecuted, you might be thinking, no thanks, I don't want the good life like that. That sounds, that sounds too uncomfortable. Maybe you're like me. You know that God has gifted you for something, called you to do something, given you the training to do something, but uh, you'd rather not do that particular ministry. And so you have run from it rather than embrace it. It's a little embarrassing for me to say this while I'm up here right now, but I have been running from this experience of being on this stage preaching for four years. Yeah, you're laughing, but it's true, and it's sad. When, when I got hired at Calvary, there were three pastors that wanted to preach, and now there's only two, and now I'm up here. Um, okay. But, but seriously, how, how sad to think about. Four years, seriously? The, the last time I preached a sermon on a weekend was four years ago. And um, I'm glad to be here. And I find God's humor very ironic that this is the message um, <laughs> that I come back to. But some of us are in the same boat, right? God's given us something to do, but we have our excuses for not doing it and running from it, even though it's probably what God wants to bless in our life. I'm just glad I didn't have to get swallowed by a fish to get up here. <laughs> and that's a spoiler alert if you don't know how the story goes. Um, 
So what has God asked you to do? Has he asked you to commit to following Jesus, to serve him in some way, to repent of some sin? Is there a conversation God has asked you to embark on with someone else that you've been putting off? What have you been running from because following God's plan just seems too uncomfortable? You know what it is. And if we follow Jonah's example and run from the discomfort of following God, we will soon learn the second reality, and that is that there is pain in running from God. There is pain in running from God. This is far worse than the discomfort of following God. See, Jonah decided he wouldn't experience the discomfort of following God, so he ran. He went in the opposite direction. Nineveh was east, he went west. He got in a boat, he, went ac- he sailed into the Mediterranean Ocean, and God was not going to let him get away. And so God sent a storm to chase after Jonah. And it wasn't just a little storm, this was a pretty good sized storm because you have a boat that's feeling like it's gonna break apart. You have seasoned sailors that are scared and terrified for their life. So let's read what happens with the storm. If you got your book open still, uh, look at verse seven. And they said to one another, that's the sailors, they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from and what is your country and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid, and they said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up, hurl me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you. And for I know that it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode harder to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. We see here that God won't let us keep running. He's not gonna ignore our running from him. He wasn't about to let Jonah get away with this. So God sends a storm, and this storm is such that the captain of the ship comes to him, and while he's sleeping, I mean, this guy is really dead to what God's doing. You know, the captain comes and says, hey, wake up, pray, pray, you need to pray. So you've got this captain that doesn't know God saying, pray to your God. Then you have the sailors basically forcing Jonah to confess what's going on. These men who didn't know the God of the Bible were more sensitive to God's direction than Jonah was. And this is, this is ironic. Jonah knew that God was gracious, right? He knew that. He knew that God would be loving. He knew that God would be merciful and kind. And he knew, I think he knew, he should have known at least, that he could have escaped this storm by simply saying, I'm wrong, I'm running from God and I need to go back to Israel. And and if he had confessed and he had said, God, forgive me, we're turning this ship around and I'm going back to Israel and I'm going to obey, I think that's an alternative version of the story that could have been true. But Jonah didn't do that. He continued to run. He continued to run from God. And instead of looking to God for grace and for mercy, he basically says, I'd rather die. What you should do is throw me into the raging sea. 
Just throw me overboard. Let me sink to the bottom. Then the sea will be quiet. Do we have the same experience with God? We know that God is gracious, but rather than running to his grace, we continue to run away. We think we can pay the price for our failure. We wanna beat ourselves up a little bit more. We want to be the sacrifice, so in self-reliance, we shake our fist at God, and we say, I've got this, and we tell God, I don't need you. If you're in that boat and you're running from God, if you're experiencing the pain of your own sin and rebellion, I certainly hope you will not follow Jonah's example. Confess, turn from the foolishness, turn from the running, turn from the rebellion, and experience God's grace. Jesus paid the price of our rebellion. He paid that price. He died so we wouldn't have to. Jesus purchased that grace that we so desperately need. And Jonah experienced the pain of his running and he just kept on running. He was willing to take the ultimate pain of death by drowning, which I think has gotta be one of the worst ways to die, rather than obey God. And even in the face of this total rebellion, God interrupts our lives with grace. God interrupts our lives with grace. God's plan of grace will not be stopped. Look at how chapter one ends. Verse 15. So they picked up Jonah and they hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So first off, we see that God interrupts the sailors' lives with grace, right? When, when they see how God calms the storm instantly, they feared the Lord and they offered sacrifices. These guys started out their journey not knowing the God of the Bible, and they ended the journey calling him Lord. Do you see that? There's a transition throughout the whole story. They're talking about a God, the God, uh, you know, one of many gods, and then at the end, they, they cry out to the Lord. It's interesting, the, the sailors keep moving closer and closer to God throughout this story, while Jonah keeps moving further and further away. He's in Israel hearing God's voice, and then he goes to a ship and then just to get a little further away from the surface, he goes down into the hull of the ship. And then he's ending the story in the ocean, sinking down. He's going further and further from God, but the sailors draw nearer and nearer. God interrupts their life with grace. Now, God interrupts Jonah's life with grace, too. In the midst of his rebellion, God sends a fish to rescue this stubborn prophet. And a fish swallows him to save him. Now we need to take a quick side note here. Do we really believe this? Do we really believe that a man was swallowed by a fish and he lived for three days there and he was able to tell about it? The answer is yes, we do. We do because it's in the Bible. But we also do because Jesus believed this. If you want, turn in your scriptures to uh, Matthew 12. If you don't want to go there, I'll read it real quick. But in Matthew 12, verses 39 through 40, you have Jesus referring to this story about Jonah. So Jesus answered them and he said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus believed this story was true, that this really happened. And he used the fact that this really happened to Jonah to tell those who would witness his resurrection that this is the sign you should be looking for. Jesus was going to die on the cross 
and then three days later, after buried in the tomb, three days later, come back to life. The sign of Jonah. What happened to Jonah happened to Jesus. And this was a proof, right, in Jesus' mind that you should believe in him. <laughs> you should believe in him and follow him. God wants to interrupt our lives with grace. If you've never experienced the grace of that forgiveness that Jesus brings, today is the day, now is the time to do that. Jesus took care of the forgiveness you need. He purchased the grace that we need when he died on that cross and when he rose again. And he did it to save you, but not just to save you, but to make your life better because of him. Please do not, if you are, please do not keep running from God's grace. If today you want to stop running from that initial experience of grace with Jesus, would you please talk to one of the pastors today or at the end of the service, would you come and talk to one of the prayer team members? Because you can do it right now where you are. You can just turn from your running and you can tell God that you're stopping and you're trusting in Jesus and you're running to his grace. If you're saved and you've never taken that step of baptism because it seems too nerve wracking to get up in front of people or it just seems too odd to take a bath in front of uh, hundreds of people, <laughs> you know, today's a, a day to make a decision to stop, right? Take out that connect card and check off baptism with your name on the other side so we can get you on the schedule. Maybe Easter is the right day for you. Maybe there's a ministry that you're called to. Life group leadership, youth leaders, children's ministry, welcome team. I mean, God could be leading you in so many different ways to serve him. Take a step today. Let's make it really practical. In those seat pockets in front of you, there's little next step cards. Put your name on it and check off the ministry that God's been asking you to get involved with. And someone will call you and help you go through the steps to get there. Maybe there's a relationship that you know God is asking you to fix or to at least start to fix. Right now, get out your cell phone and send a text. Say, hey, I wanna get together, I wanna talk. Can we have a phone call? Can we get coffee? Start to follow God and stop running from what he's asking you to do. Maybe you have a habit that you really want to break. Monday night, celebrate recovery. Come, come back to this campus and hear how other people have stopped running from God and are experiencing broken habits and a new life in Jesus. Whatever it is, whatever God's leading you to, why not stop running? Why not avoid the pain of continually running from God and his grace? His grace is ready to change your life. If you'll invite him to, he will interrupt your life with grace. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, when we come to your word, we we don't know exactly what you wanna do, but we know that your word is true, we know that your word is good, and we know that you want us, want us to obey it. And Lord, the great thing about obeying your word is that when we obey it, we're coming to your grace. We're coming to undeserved gifts, gifts of forgiveness, gifts of purpose, gifts of love, gifts of relationship, gifts of connection with you and with others. And so we thank you for that, Lord, and we ask that you would guide our next steps so that we'll be running towards you, so that we'll experience more and more of your grace. Lord, we give our lives to you today. Make us obedient. Help us to walk in your grace. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.